Forest garden is a three-dimensional garden of useful plants. So there's trees, shrubs, ground cover plants, perennial plants, all designed to maximize beneficial interactions and minimize competition, designed to be uh, sustainable in the long term by having plants that feed other plants, uh, by having plants for bees to sustain a pollinating population. Uh, sustainable from other ways too, because most of the plants are perennial, uh, you know, trees or, or smaller plants, uh, and so the soil is not dug most, most of the time. And not digging the soil is really important in terms of sustainability, because every time you dig the soil, a load of carbon goes into the air. This is looking quite good at the moment. Uh, this is Chinese dogwood, which is, uh, uh, as you can see, a, a fantastic, beautiful plant in flower, but actually has a very nice edible fruit, uh, which follows later in the year. Apart from food, there are various other things you can grow, and I do in this forest garden. So I include medicinal plants, uh, I include plants for dyeing, for basketry use, plants for fibres, um, there are of course a lot of bee plants, sometimes plants are here specifically for bees. So um, you might look at a, a particular plant in this forest garden and I won't necessarily harvest that plant myself. It might have a, you know, a system function in terms of either feeding another plant or it might be here specifically for bees because it flowers at a good time of, at a good time of year for bees and so on. So there's plants for all sorts of, of different uses. There's, I, I think forest gardens will have a role to play. They are. You know, there's an awful lot of interest at the moment in forest gardens. Um, of course, mainstream agriculture, of course, is completely dependent on oil. And, and you know, what happens to oil um, uh, will have a big effect. And, of course, the oil price will almost certainly go up and up over the decades to come because, you know, demand will exceed supply. In this country particularly, you know, tree, uh, you know farmers don't tend to know much about trees and foresters don't mu know much about farming and agroforestry which is kind of in the middle of the two therefore is quite it seems quite difficult for, for think people like farmers to access because you know they're, they're not comfortable with trees so so that that's a potential problem uh, that could slow down you know the the the, the imp implementation of, of more agroforestry based systems on, on, on farmland but I think it needs to happen um, and I think slowly it will happen but um, um, I think it will take, unfortunately, I think it'll take a crisis or two, you know, a serious crisis or two, to actually jolt, uh, jolt the powers that be into, into actually, you know, making it happen quicker. Uh, this is one of my main salad leaves uh, from, from the forest garden. It's the young leaves you use, this, this kind of leaf. Not the old ones, the old ones will be tough. Uh, an interesting parallel to, to times which may be coming, you know, when in, in the Cold War years um, the Soviet Union did a lot of fruit breeding because they wanted to be self-sufficient in fruit, you know, they didn't want to have to import fruit from a long distance away, particularly from, you know, the West. Um, uh, and so they did a lot of interesting fruit breeding, this is one of the plants they bred, in fact. Um, uh, and, and, you know, that, that, that has a parallel in that, in that, of course, at the moment, uh, as a country, you know, we import a lot of our food uh, and there's no reason why we couldn't more or less uh, grow most of it here. Um, and of course that's got to be, that's got to be sensible from a sustainability and resilience uh, aspect. It's got to be sensible, although governments haven't got it yet. Forest gardens are, are resilient because of the, um, because of the diversity really. So it's, it's, it's diversity of structure. Um, so lots of different plants at different, at different levels, but also di uh, sp diversity of uh, species. So uh, this forest garden has about 550 species in it, um, uh, which is probably more than, than most because I'm doing a lot of research and experimenting as well. But it's very common for um, forest gardens to have 200 species in, you know, uh, the majority of which will be food plants, you know, which, which to, to us, when we're used to, um, you know, eating 20 types of vegetable or something, uh, you know, if you're talking about 200 types of food plant, people initially might be slightly overwhelmed. But actually, um, 
uh, I regard that as, as actually probably much more normal than, than relying on 20. Uh, you know, I think uh, um, if you look at um, if you look at our, our near relatives, things like orangutans, they regularly eat 400 different types of leaf and fruit. They know everyone. They recognise everyone. You know, they know exactly what they're picking. Uh, there's no reason we couldn't do the same. And, and I suspect, um, you know, a diverse diet will lead to more resilient people as well. Bamboos are fantastically uh, useful plants and of course in China and, and Japan and other parts of Asia they use bamboo for uh, more things than you could, you could think of. This one's growing about 20 centimetres a day at the moment uh, because of this warm weather. So um, yeah, and you can actually hear them growing. Bamboos are the only plant I can claim to, to have heard growing because when it's growing that fast and you put your ear near the top here you can, you can hear the, the fibres unfurling and, and crackling away. So um, if I just cut the top off of that uh, and cut it down the middle. Um, it's very interesting. Inside you'll see um, you can see what are going to be the nodes which are these bits on the bamboo cane um, and everything inside that's white or light green is edible. So you peel off the outer leaves uh, and then the inside bit is edible. You normally steam that. Just steam it for five or ten minutes and then, it, and then uh, because they're normally bitter raw. Uh, this garden is now 16 years old and um, I've certainly seen, I've seen climate changes in that time. Um, mainly, you know, increased average temperatures and fewer spring frosts. Dry springs is something that most farmers hate because um, They've just sown all their spring crops, or horticulturists for that matter, you know, uh, and dry weather is just what they don't want in spring. So, so that can be quite severe uh, in terms of growing annual plants. So, you know, obviously if you're growing perennial plants, a dry spring is, is more or less irrelevant. You know, it won't have very much effect at all. Um, and similarly, you know, uh, you know, extremes of weather at other times of year are going to have much less effect on perennial crops than, than, on, uh, than on annuals as a rule. Fungi are probably the most important organisms of all in this forest garden and of course most of the time we don't see them because they're under the soil surface. Um, and um, the fungi I'm talking about are, are mycorrhizal fungi, or, which are beneficial fungi that form relationships with almost all plant roots. Um, and they do some amazing things. Um, uh, when they form an association with plant roots, they basically give the plant hard to get nutrients because fungi can get those out of the ground much more efficiently than plants. And the plant gives the fungi some sugars in return, so it's kind of a symbiosis. Um, but they do other things as well. They protect the plant from diseases um, and uh, they move nutrients around in natural ecosystems and in something like a forest garden. Um, uh, if, if there's more nutrients of, of, of one sort in one part of the soil and a lack in another sort part of the soil, these fungi will move it, physically move it from one place to another and then a, a tree in another place will use it. So that's how things like nitrogen from my nitrogen fixing trees gets round to fruit trees that need it, the fungi move it for you. The other thing that these fungi do, uh, uh, which has really only just been discovered in the last few years, is that they're critical in sequestering carbon in stable states in the soil. So without them, you won't get sequ sequestration into the soil. Um, and of course, you don't get these fungi where you dig the soil. And there's, there's huge um, potential you know, for sequestering more carbon into the soil. Um, you know, and, and, and and certainly, you know, everybody seems to want to do that, but, um, but to do that you're going to have to move to a much more perennial system. This is poke root, um, which is a, quite a well-known American wild edible. You eat the shoots that come through, which are, tend to be at the beginning of June, so it's, so it's a kind of very late spring or uh, crop really, and the shoots come through are, are really thick like you can see here. Um, you cook those and they are a sort of earthy asparagus flavour to them, really, really substantial vegetable. But poisonous when it's raw, 
you know, so you have to cook it. But there's lots of plants, you know, that we eat uh, that are poisonous in one state or another. Um, and I always think if, you know, if potatoes were discovered now, they probably wouldn't be allowed in this country because, you know, green potatoes are quite poisonous. Uh, I mean, my estimate is that, that you could certainly feed four or five people off an acre of forest garden. I use a lot of, of aromatic plants down in my perennial layers, so a lot of different types, sorts of mint, for example, and, and lemon balm and oregano and other herbs. Um, uh, some of which, of course, is harvested, but, but um, it's doing, it's doing a, a, some useful functions, has some useful functions even if you don't harvest it down in this layer because they're, you know, they're rich in essential oils, mints and other aromatic plants, and, and um, uh, you know, those essential oils are antibacterial and antifungal, so having those in the understory layers um, uh, should have a protective effect, you know, for other plants in terms of reducing bacterial diseases and fungal diseases. The medlar is a fantastic fruit tree, which um, a lot of people don't know. Uh, but it, you can see the young fruits here. These grow to about three, three and a half centimeters diameter uh, and, and ripen on the tree in, in warm summers. Otherwise, you pick them at the first frost and take them indoors, and then they ripen and, uh, with a sort of um, very sweet, uh, sort of date, baked apple type flavor. Uh, to them, really nice edible fruit, um, and, and also, you know, again, very low maintenance. Doesn't have any pests or diseases. It just looks after itself. Monoculture crops have been dominating, you know, all agricultural research for for hundreds of years, and um, and even now, you know, mainstream agricultural scientists they don't like looking at more than one crop in one place. You know, it makes things very complicated for them. This is Sichuan pepper, um, which is obviously a commercial crop grown in China mainly. Um, but it's a shrub, as you can see, a large shrub. And you can see it's just finished flowering and it's just starting to form the peppercorns here. Um, and each of those will, will form a, um, a, a, a roundish fruit, so with a, with a black seed in the middle and a, and a sort of pink shell round, round, round the outside. And it's actually that pink shell that's the spice. You don't have to use black pepper if you have something like this. Mm -hmm.